and my dad was a mining engineer and a really sort of a rough, tough sort of a guy, bigger than I am, fantastic athlete, and uh, a really good scholar. So he, some of the professors that uh, I went through at Michigan Tech uh, had passed him with flying colors and they said, you know, you're gonna have to shape up or you're out of here. <laughs> so. He was a tough uh, act to follow. Oh, well, he wasn't that kind of a guy to be, you know, but he was a tough act to follow for everybody. Right. So. Uh, was it hard to work for him? No, you know, not at all. Father and son often, or any well, family, now, you know. Yeah, no, it, it, uh, you know, I had uh, worked on uh, vacation periods and and uh, so forth. And then I went through the military service and I came out of military service and uh, decided I was going to either go into mining geology or mining. And uh, uh, he talked me out of that, but uh, I'd only worked with him full time for about three months. And uh, we just had a marvelous time. Uh, yeah, mom died when I was quite young, and so he just was a bachelor the rest of his life. And uh, were you close then? Did that bring very you close? close. Yeah. yeah, very close. And my two sisters and I, the three of us, were all very close. I had an aunt who, uh, dad's sister, who left uh, uh, the military uh, wasps. She was a pilot too, and uh, and and to come and take over when mom died. And so uh, uh, that was our family, my aunt. And I, when you started, you described your dad as a, um, a scientist, was it a scientist and an inventor or an engineer and an inventor? He's an engineer and inventor. He was a mining engineer and an inventor. Turned out he, our, uh, our uh, patent uh, attorney, uh, thought of him as one of these people that is uh, constantly thinking, not out of the box, but, but thinking creatively on everything, not following anybody else's general ideas. And so uh, he felt he was really a professional inventor and then a, uh, a top mining engineer, and he was. I saw the progression of the, the tunnel boring machines from the early stages. Yeah. Is there anything that strikes you about the progression that <coughs> I know we've got these? Yes. Is this, um, the, the progression that you thought of, you know, this is, it's great to see this innovation coming yeah. in. And you said something like it seemed to go in sort of hops every, yeah. every 30 years, it'd stale, and then it'd be in, in another 30 years a big yeah, improvement. Right. Do you have any idea why that was the case, maybe? Well, we, I probably didn't express that properly in yeah. that little talk, but uh, there were, like Barbara Stack, discovered there were 50, I think 57, yeah. sort of inventors, engineers, during that early period, all of whom had their own individual, some of them had invented two or three different kinds of machines. Uh, some of them only one, and none of them had ever, you know, really stuck or uh, made the grade to uh, make the machine a profitable product. And so um, uh, that's one of the important things with my dad. He uh, invented tunneling machines. He thought he was the first to ever do it. He didn't learn until like two years later that the channel tunnel thing had involved five or six different people that are all doing the same thing he was doing. And he, he uh, didn't discover that he wasn't the first guy. And this was way before Barbara Stack had, in, had discovered all these hundreds of uh, people working in this field. Efforts. Well, that's what they say, you know, sometimes you, if you knew about the business you were going <coughs> into, all the nuts and bolts, you'd never go into it because you'd be just daunted by 
you know, all that the, could be, yeah. you know, so it's great to <coughs> almost be ignorant or in a vacuum when you're trying to create something. Um, the Channel Tunnel was a huge, I mean, what an incredible project to have worked on. Oh, yeah, the, the, uh, for your company. And do you mm -hmm. think that your father would have been thrilled to, that you've been? Oh, yeah, he would have, uh, well, you know, on the other hand, he might have come up with some fantastic, I know he would have come up with some fantastic ideas uh, that uh, we never did struggle to do and, uh, or to achieve. Uh, some of them we probably did 30 years after he would have done them in, in, a, in a, a couple of years. And uh, so he was that kind of a guy. And he, he was very foresighted, and he would come up with marvelous technical solutions. And he was a great salesman. So he would have customers that uh, the machine is struggling, it's not really working, they're not getting anywhere, and he would, able, he would be able to talk them into, uh, oh, you know, just a couple hundred thousand more, and we'll be able to make this thing <laughs> work, you know. And so uh, I don't know how he did it, but uh, he kept things going even when things were terrible and the machines weren't working. Uh, there was a big group of these small machines. He built uh, uh, four different small tunneling machines, all of which one after another failed to operate because the, the cutting system was not able to cut the rock. And so that's when he realized the problem is uh, that the, uh, the cutters just aren't going to make it with drag picks. So you've got to get rid of the drag picks. So, you know, maybe we should try with drag picks and disc cutters, but then get rid of the drag picks and just see if the disc cutters work by themselves. And they work like a dream. The whole machine went ahead faster than uh, it was with the, with the picks. It would be nice to have been there when he, when the, he yeah. saw that right and went, uh, here we go, uh, it's working. I know, and I wasn't, I was in the military at that moment, but uh, What a great anyway. achievement for him. Oh, yeah. yeah. After four years, four failed machines, and then like, <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly right. It was, uh, it was quite, it must have been quite an experience. And but I, you've done a lot of work on cutter heads yourself. Oh, yeah. You know, you've taken that from where he started forward, too, which is... Well, I, he gave me a job to work on cutters, cutter uh, arrangements and developments, and I had the right geometry in mind. Uh, we were completely... Uh, most of the ones that, that I was working on wouldn't have worked very well either, but at least the geometry was right. But uh, anyway, it, his uh, guidance was... Uh, uh, what got me enthusiastic and I stayed excited about what I was doing uh, for that period of time when he was still there and then one day he just didn't show up. He was flying back from Denver on a business job and, and uh, we kind of expected him to come in uh, the next day and uh, he didn't and uh, so then we weren't excited about it because he'd, you know, right. gone off some other place, and and uh, so about a week uh, later, well, we we didn't think there was anything to carry on. We right. thought he was still going to show up. Oh, got you. We found out that uh, well, his body and his airplane was discovered. I think it was seven months later. Oh my gosh! Hadn't they you hadn't know for seven months? No. In fact, it just I, disappeared off the face of the yeah, earth for you guys. Yeah, right. And my uh, banker uh, and lawyer came to me and said, look, we've got to make a payment. We've got to make a payroll. We've got bills to pay. Dad was the only one with the, uh, an account that, that had a signature. And so uh, we went down to the, the banker, and, and he said, look, you know, we can't do this. He might show up at any moment. <laughs> Oh my gosh, and, uh, so you had to lay people off? Well, I did talk them into it. Yeah. So I was nice. using my sales pitch at that point. But I, uh, so we uh, kept our staff 
going and uh, uh, finishing. We had to finish a tunneling machine, then we had to uh, put it into service on the Oahe Dam, the, the uh, fourth Oahe Dam machine. And uh, our field service guys, three of them I think they were, went off and made the machine uh, work and uh, the rest all got laid off. And uh, so that's, that's what happened for nearly a year. Yeah. And then we got that uh, Tasmanian contract. Sure. And uh, so it was just, there was a lot of luck. Yeah, but business is a lot of hard work, a little bit of luck. I mean, it's a little bit of timing, right place, yeah. right. I mean, it's success yeah. is all a little bit of, well, you know, you, to make you have to have, you the, have all the recipe. Right. right. We had to have the luck on top of a lot of hard bright people work. and and hardworking people. Yeah. Uh, Last couple of questions. Um, when you look at where tunnel boring machines or mechanized tunneling has come, <coughs> and the innovations that are going on now, what can you foresee in the future? Is it exciting to see the developments that are going on now? And what sort of developments do you think that are going on now are, are important, that you think will have significant impact, if any, on Well, it depends on the type of machine. Right. <clears throat> uh, for example, there's all kinds of possibilities in soft ground. And uh, uh, I'm not able to talk uh, all of my engineers into doing what I want to do because mon many of these ideas that I've had, uh, I've had people help me lay, up, lay them out and see what these ideas would look like on paper. They're going to be too expensive and too difficult to do. So great ideas, I think, and there's still some. That, that may convert, but um, uh, the so you, you talk about hard rock, and there's all kinds of good possibilities in hard rock. But now I'm looking at things like uh, the very, very uh, highly stressed deep rock under the mountains in the Andes and in the Himalayas and and uh, even in the Alps. The but, Rockies? But, and the Rockies, but you see, those mountains are old, the Alps and the, and the Rockies, and they aren't as highly stressed now as they used to be. You have to get very deep, and that's gravity mostly. But if you go to the, the uh, uh, Alps, they're still moving. And if you go down to uh, the Andes, it's really moving, and the ground is just practically falling apart by itself and you're two kilometers below the surface so you've got the, the gravity and then you've also got the mountain stress and we've had machines just actually get crushed and these are the whole machine so if you come to the conclusion that you better when you go into a job like that you had better have a spare machine and then enough cash to start making the third one when the first one fails and now you're on your spare, you know, because the, the, the ground was destroying us. And uh, so this was really exciting because I think we have the possibility to combine uh, uh, tunneling machines for overstressed rock like that in a way that can keep the ground under control and then use a yielding support system well i mean you know it's there's uh, the a plain vanilla really hard rock right. with good hard rock cutters is something that we've been able to do now for some years and our competitors can all do it too but when you combine that with a really overstressed rock. The rock is destroying itself. When you make a hole in it, it wants to close it up, but it, it's explosive. And so now, if you've got a tunnel, like we had this, this one job in, uh, down in Peru, in the Olmos project, uh, they just were lucky that we ever finished it. 
but we did. And now they got water going through it. So, uh, what project was that? It's, was that the one you showed us? Yeah, yeah. I and you, I, I did a little uh, uh, rock burst showing, but the big rock burst. I mean, there were people that were injured. Uh, lots of it happened over and over again. So uh, we were very fortunate when the last time the machine got just crushed. Uh, the we repaired it. Uh, it took about three months, and then we started uh, going ahead, and the rock began to uh, become less stressed. We just went out of this huge stress zone, and we're able to finish the tunnel uh, about a year later. And uh, it was still highly stressed, but it wasn't. Uh, you know, explosive. How about the disc cutters? You were talking about these new versions of disc cutters. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Is, well, um, is that a new innovation? You think it is. And around? that's that's what our uh, uh, cutter work team is developing, along with a whole lot of other uh, uh, cutter developments, some of which we don't like to talk about. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. and uh, uh, that job, we fought for two years to get the job, and then we lost it to Hitachi Zozen. But they decided that we had features that they needed. And so we sold, we're selling our cutters to them. So we've now uh, still have a little tiny piece of that job, which uh, is pretty exciting. And uh, it's a very difficult job. It will be a difficult job. And so. Are you still, ex are you still, like you said, you're innovating, but you're slowing down. You're still innovating, you're still ex excited. Do you oh, get yeah. these, you know, moments where you see the vision, like, ah! Yeah, well, you know, uh, that's, I think I feel my, uh, one of my uh, talents or, or strengths is to sense what's going on in the rock and in the ground. And the machine has to uh, be part of, it's causing the hole, so <laughs> making the hole. And so the machine and the ground have to be working together. And uh, I can sort of sense when things aren't, aren't working right. And uh, you know, you can analyze all this stuff with uh, structural analysis and finite element analysis and all kinds of things of that nature that um, uh, I used to be able to do, but now we have experts that do that. Uh, if you do that as a uh, acad academic person, uh, you often don't get the right answer, even though you've analyzed it all the way, uh, because it isn't just the analysis of that structural problem it it's something you need to have a sense of the geology even if it's soft ground but uh, you know uh, you're working with the soil or with the rock and uh, especially when it's mixed in, in mixed conditions in in one phase that makes it uh, something that you have to be able to sense what the machine is facing to make this happen do you still go in every day to work? Or no, Or do I they don't. call you on a like, and consult, like, we need your help. Can you come in and take a look at this? What do you think? Is that how it works? I do, uh, I do get in from time to time. And uh, we spend some time talking about cutters still. But um, I, uh, I'm really completely retired. I'm on the board, or I've been on the board until just recently, and I just retired from the board. When was that? Oh, a few months ago. Yeah, this so, year then. Yeah. yeah. And so that's, uh, I'm trying to completely uh, yeah. back away. And but I've got so many other things that I'm anxious to do that I haven't yet done. Like? Well, I mean, all kinds of things. Uh, you know, uh, hobbies, I would say. Fly fishing, uh, sailing. I'm now rowing. Uh, and uh, uh, a competitive rowing team. And uh, 
usually I'm the oldest guy there because uh, in two months I'll be 80. But uh, it, uh, but anyway, I'm staying fit. And, and life is good. Yeah, it is. And then. Uh, your wife is healthy. You guys are yeah. traveling around together, yeah. spending more time. I mean, you know, when you're right. in a career, it really sucks up a lot of your time. Oh, and yeah. mental energy, right, I would imagine. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> so I found out that uh, my mental energy isn't really there now for real work. This, <laughs> just pre uh, preparing for this talk. It was uh, more than I've done for quite a number of years, and it's basically more than I'm feeling I'm up to now. Speaking of, do you feel, felt the honor? Do you, I mean, look, are you uh, pleased that you chose the career that you did working with the people that you do? There seems to be an incredible, I'm just new to the industry, but I see this incredible energy here and um, sharing of information. I mean, you're competitors, but you're also work together. You know, you're hungry wow. for information. It's a very interesting you know, Dynamic. that's true, and there's a, there's a group uh, that is not only part of the ITA, but right now it is a, an official part of the ITA, this ITA tech group, that involves most of our uh, competitors, if not all of them, but most of them, are working together. Now, I'm not part of that here, but when Lock Home and and a bunch of our competitors get together and they try to figure out what can they do that will be a constructive uh, con contribution to uh, tunneling technology and be good for, the, for everybody. Uh, then they begin to share technology and uh, there's the danger there. Uh, right. It's an extreme complication, and our company is very, very, very careful not to have uh, any collaboration that would compromise what our customers expect. Now, for years and years, we would make proposals, a custom-designed machine for a particular job, and we'd have three different customers with three different designs, uh, uh, completely giving us uh, the idea that this is the, what we think the, the geology is like, so this is the kind of machine we think we ought to have. What do you think about that? Well, we could build that kind of machine, but it should have this and that feature. So we'll make a custom design machine for a particular project and then a different uh, customer will ask us to do a different thing. Right. And we've uh, been very careful not to share any information, not only with the different uh, customers, the, the, the contractors, but also, of course, not with any of our competitors. Because yeah. uh, business is business. But it is a great industry. If you had to go back to do it over again, would you do it this would you still pick this industry? Have you enjoyed it? Oh, yeah. I've, I've found it uh, very uh, demanding and uh, very uh, risky, extremely risky. Uh, for quite a number of years, we'd go for a period of seven or eight years where we don't really bring in much because what we do earn, we spend on R&D work. And so uh, that sort of business, occasionally we're really good at coming up with a new product. And then we make a whole bunch of money for a period of five or six years, and then the competitors are all on it. And, and uh, so that uh, doesn't last very long, so you've got to find something good. But if you go through a period of 10 years without, or eight years or something like that, well, like we did, uh, where we don't have the uh, direct com competition, but a real advantage for our customers, uh, then we can make a little money. That's fantastic and the, uh, time. Yeah, and then the rest of the time, we're pouring all of the, our, our uh, margins 
that aren't earnings, but their margins anyway back into R and D work. To, for the next innovation. Yeah, sure. You've got to constantly be looking forward. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's been overall been a great, great career. It Enjoyed has. it. Would you ad would you encourage young people to go into it? Oh yeah, but you have to be the right kind of a person. What and kind? we well, it's interesting. Some people blossom into these. Uh, 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 attitudes or, or, you know, they have a good education to start with. Uh, and then if they're going to be a, a machine designer, uh, some of them are just a good machine designer. And that's all they, yeah. And others are thinking far ahead or thinking you know, we've always done it that way. Why don't we do it this way? Or have come up with a, a great idea. What do you think of this? And sometimes we say, oh no, that won't work for this reason. Or, wow, that's a great idea. Let's put some time and money into that and make it work. I can see that lights <laughs> up your eyes even today to, you know, any sort of innovation, even if it's not your own, to see that mind. Yeah. Coming, bringing, you know, to see the mind working and see how people push innovation. Yeah. Well, that's a very exciting thing for me because some of our uh, best engineers were not only on our team, but our consultants who we worked with on a sort of a, a partnership or a uh, exclusive basis. And some of these people are so brilliant you can't believe it. They come up with great ideas all the time. And rarely do we have to, or did I have to say, uh, you know, it's a novel and interesting idea, but we'll never make that work. And then you got a little competition. I mean, not competition is the right word, a little conflict huh. going there. And uh, so uh, that rarely happens. Uh, and it's always exciting to feel so, boy, we're going to have something that's so good nobody is going to catch up with us for five years with this. You know.